two, one. Welcome to another AQR Literary Hour. It's so inspiring to hear Alaska Quarterly Review contributors read their work and chat a bit. You can find recordings of previous programs at our website, aqreview.org and our YouTube channel. I'm Heather Lendy, and on behalf of the Center for Narrative and Lyric Arts and our hosts, the Anchorage Museum at Rasmussen Center, thank you for being here today. Finish Chish, as we say where I am on the banks of the Chilkat River in Haines, Alaska, or Deshu in Klinkit Ani. Before we begin, I, I do want to congratulate the 2022 Poetry Out Loud Alaska State winner, Nikolai Chavez, and the runner-up, Madeline Bremer. I, I had the great privilege to be one of the judges this first week in March down in Juneau, and Poetry Out Loud is a, is a national arts education program, and it encourages the study of poetry with a recitation competition for high school students all across the country. Um, uh, and it especially, I think, honors uh, poets and poems throughout time up to very contemporary ones. And um, that seems really more important now than ever. As Joy Harjo uh, uh, notes in, in An American Sunrise, it's impossible to make it through tragedy without poetry. And these are tragic times uh, with a war raging in Ukraine as we meet today, as, as well as all the other tragedies from the revelations about native boarding schools to climate change and of course the pandemic that just seems to wind on and on and hopefully down. Anyway, the, the, what, I, what I want to tell you is what was so heartening is that the uh, students chose to memorize uh, and, and share poems that, that reflected this from uh, the uh, Ukrainian American poet, Eli Kaminsky's, We Lived Happily During the War, and Kenneth Rexross, Discrimination, to Joy Harjo's, uh, you know, Once the World Was Perfect and They Weren't Resigned. They read Edna St. Vincent Millay's Dirge Without Music. The Spanglish by Tato Rivera uh, propelled Nikolai into the top spot. And then Madeline, she, she excelled with uh, Shakespeare's Sonnet 15, you know, when I consider everything that grows. Uh, so anyway, it was, it was very inspiring. And I thought all of you poets and poetry appreciators would like to know that uh, it's very much alive and well and in the kids in this country. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Ronald Spatz, uh, the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Alaska Quarterly Review. Ron is a professor of English at the University of Alaska, a former National Endowment for the Arts Fellow and the recipient of two Alaska Governor's Awards and a Contribution to Literacy Award from the Alaska Center for the Book. And Ron has uh, led Alaska Quarterly Review for over 40 years and has created strong connections between our state and the larger literary community, as we're gonna see again in these uh, readings today, and has also been, as we'll see again, influential in supporting new and emerging writers, as well as presenting works that include a rigorous questioning of larger societal issues. Ron? Hey, thank you, Heather, <clears throat> and uh, welcome everyone. As Heather said, this event is being recorded and will be available on the Alaska Quarterly Review YouTube channel. Please feel free to watch any of our prior programs and to share them. Alaska Quarterly Review is committed to presenting these programs without charge and to showcase vibrant and diverse new and emerging voices and literary conversations with depth, complexity, and humanity. Like all literary magazines, AQR depends on grants tax exempt donations and subscriptions to operate. If so inclined, donations and subscriptions are gratefully welcomed on AQR's website, aqrreview.org. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few important acknowledgements. Alaska Quarterly Review gratefully acknowledges the Anchorage Museum for hosting and providing technical support for this event and the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts, Alaska Quarterly Review's 501c3 umbrella organization, which makes this event possible. Alaska Quarterly Review uh, also uh, wants to make uh, a land acknowledgement. Um, we recognize the indigenous land on which all Alaskans live. AQR is located in Anchorage and Anchorage is Denina homeland. The Nina is the language spoken by the traditional, present, future caretakers of this land. Land acknowledgement opens a space with gratefulness 
and respect for the contributions, innovations, and contemporary perspective of indigenous peoples and marks our collective movement towards decolonization and equity. And now to begin, Heather Lindy will be um, introducing today's featured poets. Heather is uh, the current Alaska State Writer Laureate of Alaska, um, and uh, she has four books of nonfiction, all published by Algonquin. If you lived here, I'd know your name, take good care of the garden and the dogs, find the good, and most recently, of bears and ballads. Back to you, Heather. Thanks, uh, Ron. It's really uh, my pleasure to introduce our guests today, all uh, our AQR contributors. And I'm going to sort of start in reverse. I'm going to do some all at once. And, uh, and uh, the, the last person I introduce will go first. Um, uh, John Burkowski was born and raised in a blue collar neighborhood along the Palisades of Jersey City, overlooking Manhattan. He, he then moved to raise his family in the rural skylands of Northwestern New Jersey. He's a recipient of a 2009 National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Creative Writing, a New Jersey State Council on the Arts Distinguished Artist Fellowship, the Rose Lefkowitz Prize from Poet Lore and the Theodore Rothke Prize from David Wagner at Poetry Northwest. His first book, Driving West on the Pulaski, Pulaski Skyway, was selected by Paul Mariani for the Bordighera Prize and published in an Italian English edition in 2012. Several of his poems have been nominated for the Pushcart Prize. His work has been published uh, widely uh, from the Poetry Daily website, Poetry, Plowshares, New Ohio Review, the Gettysburg Review, Southern Poetry Review, Tar River Poetry, Poetry East, Prairie Schooner, among others. He's also a, a regular in the sun where his poems, whether about dogs doing the dishes, snowball fights are, are always a must read. And his newest book, American Chestnut was just published uh, this week. So congratulations, John. Jessica Jacobs is the author of Take Me With You, Wherever You're Going, winner of the Devil's Kitchen and Goldie Awards and Pelvis with Distance a biography and poems of Georgia O'Keeffe, winner of the New Mexico Book Award and a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award. Chapbook editor for Beloit Poetry Journal. She lives in Asheville, North Carolina with her wife, poet Nicole Brown, and with whom she co-authored Write It, 100 Poetry Prompts to Inspire, which is also a recommended book from uh, one of our AQR contributors and readers in this series, uh, Naomi Nye and is at work on a collection of poems exploring uh, Torah and Midrash. She's also a long distance runner. And I think in, in a first for this series has had a poem published and shared by ESPN. If it all comes down to this, reflections on the NCAA Women's uh, Championship, the Baylor Notre Dame game. Jessica Jacobs, who says she can write anywhere and does especially mid run on more trails and bridges and sidewalks than she can count. Francine Morosti is a Canadian lawyer and a poet. Her 2021 debut poetry collection, Iskutil Iskutu, and I hope I pronounced that right, uh, Francine, you can help again. The poetry of a Northern res girl includes the poem Since Time and Memorial, which was first published by AQR and then selected for the best American poetry. Uh, the collection uh, was written while she was working as a counsel to the Canadian National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls in 2017. In it, Francine also portrays her own experience as an Indigenous woman raised on the Pelican Narrows Reserve in the 1980s, her memories of the wilderness, and her experiences as a residential school survivor. She's also a winner of the Canadian 2019 Indigenous Voices Award. Francine Maristi, who says she writes to teach and inform all of us of her experiences growing up as an Indigenous woman in Saskatchewan. She believes it's important to share these stories and for us to read them. And uh, Francine, um, we'll hear from you first. Hi, well, thank you for the, for the awesome introduction. Um, again, my name is Francine, and um, my first publication, my first published poem was actually in the Alaska Quarterly Review. 
and that was in spring and summer edition 2020. So um, the, I had two pieces published and one of them went on to be chosen, you know, to be on the um, best American poetry, which was surprising to me. But um, it was also very special because um, I guess um, it has been published in numerous um, journals. Um, it really, you know, when people listen to it or read it, it it uh, gives them a new perspective or it does something. Anyway, uh, that's the poem I'd like to start off with in this poetry reading. And um, before I read a poem, I'll kind of introduce what it's about just so you can um, follow along and not, um, you know, when you're switching from poem to poem, you, I kind of want to give a context of where, where the poem is coming from. So this one um, is the first one that um, that uh, was published. You know, I wasn't, I was trained as a lawyer. I don't have a background in literature. Um, I started writing poetry as a way to deal with the trauma, you know, that I experienced while working for the National Inquiry, because we, we heard a lot of um, really traumatic stories of family members um, talking about their loved ones. So as a way to cope and to continue on with this job, I started writing um, poetry. And um, I guess I had a talent for it because I had entered my poetry into contests and you know, it, it uh, resonated with people. And so um, I'm still here. And this is my first book that I published, which I'm going to be reading from. Um, Iskutiw Iskwiw, Poetry of a Northern Resgora. And Iskutiw Iskwiw is a Cree, uh, they're Cree words. Iskutiw means fire and Iskwiw means woman. So fire woman. And I'm also going to be publishing a Cree version of this book. So it's all going to be in the Cree language. Um, I forgot to mention I am a member of the Cree, um, Cree Nation, and specifically the Woodland Cree, which is we, we are located in northern Saskatchewan. And um, the First Nation that I come from, there's 13,000 members of Woodland Cree, just for our um, particular group of um, people. So um, I would like to start off with a poem called Since Time Immemorial. I've heard these words spoken repeatedly as a child, a story of my indigenous history shared with audience after audience, burnt into my memory. We've been here since time immemorial. It means a time so long ago that people have no memory or knowledge of it. Filling out my law school application, how long has your family lived in Saskatchewan? I pause for a moment then write, since time immemorial. What, have, what would have been other options before Saskatchewan was, we were. I got in, nobody questioned my answer. Another one I'd like to read is about um, the residential school experience. You know, in uh, Canada, they, they um, had residential schools for indigenous children. Um, and this went on for at least 126 years where the government and uh, um, religious organization, organizations like the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, um, took kids from their families so that they could go educate them, you know, in a different place away from their parents. And so, first of all, I'd like to read a little bit of my experience. It's just a small, small poem. And this one is called Prince Albert Indian Residential School Student, which I was back in the late 80s. 
It was the late 80s. We were, we were still babies, supervised by ladies, far from home, lined up like inmates, girls crying at night, souls slowly dying. Kids running to get home, caught they had to pay. Leave it in the past, get over it, they say. But shit, I got hit. Okay then, I'll quit. I'll get good and lit. And this one is my mom's experience. Fortunately for her, she, her parents didn't, um, they didn't allow her or they prevented her from going to school. And this one is called Precious Inheritance. Joe, we're here for your children. They will receive the best education by God's holy men and women. Treated only with dignity and respect, they will eat the best foods. Comfort and laughter will fill their days. No, that's okay, Joe says. I can take care of my own children. Now, Joe, if you don't allow your children to be educated, you will not receive your monthly check. Giam, who cares? I don't need your check. You can shove it where the sun don't shine. All three walk away, one in a headdress, one in a black robe with a fancy cross, one in a pressed suit. From my hiding place, I emerge a little girl of six. The significance of my father's Giam escapes me for years. Language intact, Traditions unbroken, culture continuous, inheritance for my children. <clears throat> I'll read I'll read a poem called Pelican Narrows, which is where I'm from and where I grew up. I'm from Pelican Narrows, a res up north with crows and sparrows, nestled between pine trees by a lake with gentle breeze, a place where Nietzsche's like to tease. We are better known as Crees. Pelican people like to fish, to catch the big one, a shore lunch on a metal dish, and when someone farts, they say, whiz. Pelican people like their bannock and tea. When they're surprised, they say, e. Up north in the bush, they feel free. Looking for agreement, they say, tse. Pelican people like to camp, tents, blankets, kerosene lamps. Driving the boat, usually for grams, through wood lake and up frog portage ramp. Pelican people like moose meat. Fried with potatoes and onions, pasty we ask, jerky is a treat. Iguamina imidomitsitsik sweets. There are many more things to say, but for now I will call it a day, Iguse. So some of my poetry is um, in the Cree language. And if you get the book, um, the Cree language is translated. Um, so. Um, I will read a poem called Family Vacation. So um, when I was a kid, I always wanted to go to Disney World as, um, as a family vacation, but we went into the went to the trap line instead because my uh, mom grew up on the trap line. And so that's where she took us for vacation. <clears throat> family Vacation. Little brown girl longed to go to Disneyland. We went to the trap line instead, McGinnis Lake, on a beaver float plane high above the trees, lake upon lake, green upon green, unloading the cargo on a rickety wooden dock, hauling packs of flour and potatoes to the one room cabin with a bunk bed and a queen where Ma and Pa slept. A wooden table and chairs, all handmade, a small 
black stove with a long metal pipe peeking from the roof. The radio high above tucked away in the corner beyond the reach of children, people playing, telling stories, music playing. One summer, Johnny Cash ring a fire and it burns, burns, burns. A guttawan outside where Ma cooked, a pot of tea faithful beside the coals. Swimming all day in a dark, in dark brown water, following the many trails leading out like spider legs, never venturing far, I didn't want to meet a bear. Making tree forts, tag and croquet till late evening, supper around the campfire, loons telling us the weather tomorrow. Piling into the cabin, dad lighting the kerosene lamp. When everyone was in place, he extinguished the hiss. Told us kids a few tales, always ending with golden hand. No one told golden hand like dad, heart pumping, chilling. I'd rather have McGinnis Lake than Disneyland any summer. Um, and this one is about my mother. You know, this book I wrote is dedicated to my mother who passed about five years ago. So I'll read this and one more and I should be done. My mother's love. My mother was traditional in her ways. An unbroken line of love extended through her. Love born long ago, sparked by creator's hand. In the boreal forest, where rivers flowed pristine and lakes glistened in the morning light. This is the love that got her up in the early mornings to cook us breakfast. The love that never wavered in the midst of wicked storms. And if you want to know this love, it flows. It can be heard in the beat of the drum. Can be seen when Kukum cooks bannock in an open fire by the lake can be tasted when biting into freshly cooked moose meat, can be smelled and freshly picked mint the one put in tea, can be felt in a warm embrace, never wanting to let go. This is the love that flows through us now, an unbroken line of love extending through time, sparked by creator's hand. And the last one I'd like to read is called Reconciliation. Settler colonialism is resistant to change. It's stubborn. <clears throat> but a new vision is being created of reconciliation. I see baby steps. Hope is born in my heart even as I experience discrimination and violence. In the future, when I'm gone, if my forgiveness is needed for all the injustices I've experienced to make this vision a reality, I give it freely, I forgive. That's it. Oh, and you can get my book in at uh, Amazon. <laughs> so Amazon.ca, I think, would be um, the easiest way to get it. Thank you, Francine. Uh, Jessica. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Francine and Heather and, and Ron as well. Um, when I was in graduate school, um, I spent a lot of time reading all of the journals that were sent to my, my program. And thinking about them, like, what is the party where my poems could go there and have a really good time? Um, and AQR, hands down, was always the party I wanted to go to. Um, so it was, yeah, it was a real honor to have my, my poems appear there, I think, in 2017. Um, so I'm going to begin uh, with a poem that was published in AQR uh, from my collection, Take Me With You Wherever You're Going. And this is largely a collection of poems about, uh, about marriage, but there were some poems of childhood and adolescence that snuck in, uh, especially when early on in my relationship, uh, I found out that my wife and I had some different ideas about propriety and she was a little upset at me. And instead of um, 
making an excuse, I wrote a poem and we're still married. So I, I guess it worked. Um, why give an excuse for skinny dipping when you can tell an origin story instead? Yes, I swam naked with strangers before we married. Floated the dark coupling of creek and sky while stars lit my skin for others who were not you to see. But this was nothing new, meant nothing. As soon as I could walk, follow a trail of shed clothes and you'd find me. Mouth deep in the lake as the rain came down, watching each drop answered by a splash tipped shoot. For my eyes alone, a fugitive garden. Why would I let anything between me and that world. Back on shore, backhoes chewed hungry at the ground. Today's jagged pit, tomorrow's bulb-bordered pond. But in that taffied summer dusk, when hours bent near doubled without breaking, the whole was simply itself. In emptiness, in possession of nothing. In emptiness to be filled with whatever I saw fit. 96 degrees and 100% humidity equaled weather the same without as within. The heat amniotic, the pit slick with the once held breath of earth with runnels of mud from afternoon rain. In a blue two-piece, I slid the sides until my parents left and so did the suit. New flesh on new soil, baptized dark by dirt. Covered that way, I was made more visible. The hunger to plunge deep enough into every moment to have my tongue swimming in it, to learn the world with my body. A map traced out indelible, a map that would one day lead me to you. And in a drastic change of pace, um, I'm going to read uh, the rest of the poems I read uh, will be from a forthcoming collection, uh, which responds portion by portion to the book of Genesis. Um, and I thought that with following up a poem with, with so much mud, um, there's a great tradition um, in the Hebrew Bible of the earth being an active participant in human affairs. Um, and in the, the case of Cain killing his brother, the earth actually cries out. And I feel like it's really time that we need to listen to what the earth has to say. Uh, so to begin with a, a quote from Genesis chapter four, and God said to Cain, cursed are you from the ground that, opens it, that opened its mouth to take your brother's blood from your hand. And the ground opens its mouth to speak. Dear wandering dust, dear vagrant clay, dear humans made of me, how quickly you've forgotten. I am not just a backdrop for your horrors. Read your holy book. Stars and trees join in battle, hills mourn, Valleys and waves tremble and writhe at the approach of God. And how many of your slaughtered have I choked down? I've borne witness to the force you've raised, evicting owls, salamanders, wolves, building your houses in hills just waiting to be wildfires. I am trying to warn you. For every season, I send wrong weather, drain reefs of their color, let whole species go extinct. Yet you go on, enough, too much. You are no longer the protagonist of this story. So try this other one. Seeing something he wanted across the road, a boy dropped his mother's hand and ran into the onslaught of traffic. She screamed his name, rooted there, unable to look away. At the clamor and rush, at a mirror hissing so close past his ear, it raised the small hairs 
inside it, he ran back to her. Weeping, she slapped him hard. Weeping, he pressed the heat of his cheek to her chest. That slap, pain now to stave off worse later. A mark to carry with him and remember. I am so tired of being afraid for you. Uh, but, but of course we, we do not listen. Um, and that was something I couldn't help but think about when delving into the story of the flood and Noah. And if you read that story very closely, what you find is, is Noah has 140 years between the moment that God warns him about the flood and when he actually builds the ark and the flood happens. And one of the things that, that commentators say again and again is he is a silent. He never speaks, he never warns anyone. And then he builds an ark that is only small enough, only large enough for his immediate family and animals. Um, and I just think about how we are building our own arcs, us wealthy nations, and the people who are most affected by the climate crisis are those who are least able to create things to save them. Um, so what can we do? What is our responsibility? Uh, and the only um, information you need for this poem is that the Hebrew word teva, which is normally translated as ark, uh, can also be translated as word. Collective nouns, as word, yeah, collective nouns. When Noah was still just a man, not yet sailor and savior, God said, make yourself a word, for I have decided to silence all flesh. Scraping muscle from a hide, his wife crouched nearby, listening. Without argument or question, without a single signal of warning to neighbors or friends, her husband, that little wind-up toy, God's docile errand boy, complied. He built the word to spec, big enough to hold two of every creature, but too small for her mother, too small for her brother, no matter how she begged. From planks of gopher wood smeared with pitch, Noah built the word and God shut them up in it. Water crushed down from the sky, fountained from the seas, dissolving living dust and breath to wreaths of hushed mud. And Noah, a silent man in a silenced world, drifting in a wooden word. With an otter placid as a stole across his shoulders, instead of talking, he lived in his hands, picking nits, troughing food and water, always more water, tending, tending to every walking, creeping, winged thing, to all beings but her, never lying beside her, never tasting the taste of sleep. His tongue withered to a husk. The dark hold was mobbed with chitter, roar, and screech without restraint, and from outside, the ceaseless babble of wood and rain. She was drowning in languages she couldn't speak, and he never offered her a word of comfort. When the rain finally ended, Noah bound a rope to the rafters. Before the raven, before the doves, he lowered himself from the word's one window. A splash, and he leashed the rope to his ankle, leaned back and let his hands fall empty, let the flood embrace him. Grime sloughed from him into the waves until the only animal he smelled was himself. Noah bobbed there, a beaming boy, tethered to the word in which the future floated, where his wife, unseen, the new Eve, humanity's unnamed mother, 
looked out from the window and watched as he gave himself to the killing waters, looked past him, trying not to think of the death and rot that brothed him. Is a man good, she wondered, who can construct a word large enough for only a chosen few? And now, regardless of any covenant that once rainbowed the sky, before the world is again silenced, the water and weather already rising, what noun collective, what peaceful fleet lashed by syntax and spring lines into a sentence of survival, what new words can we build to save us all? Uh, and I'm going to end on a <laughs> slightly lighter note, I guess. Um, one of the things I've been uh, really fascinated by is etymology and how uh, phrases that are commonly translated in one way actually mean something else when you really delve into them. Um, Mazel tov. Circular breather. Our dog can whine without ceasing his tail thumping the wall beside the bed to call me up and out to the yard instead. In moonlight, the hydrangea's white blossoms are a zodiac of branch-bound constellations. Once God called Abraham out from his tent to the open field to count the uncountable lights in the sky, promising offspring bountiful as dust, numerous as the stars. Like Abraham, I too left my land, my birthplace, my father's house. But the closest I have to an offspring is lifting his leg at the azalea, nose busy with the news the night air brings. Mazel tov, we say at births and other joyous occasions, the Jewish go-to for congratulations. Yet tov means good, and mazel constellation or destiny. And sometimes, like Abraham, you must leave the place that grew you to grow toward better stars. In the house, my wife is sleeping. Along the fence top, a procession of possums reminds that even in darkness, there are those who can see. Above, trees thick with summer frame a porthole of sky. Maybe, though, it's not always the stars that matter, but the space between them, the lines that we draw to shape the absence, the lives we forge around what goes missing. From the deck, the cool breeze makes a festival of the silver lit leaves. Under my palm, there's the warmth of his fur, the rise of his ribs. He doesn't suspect his kidneys are failing that his muzzle is white as the winter our vet has said he will not live to see. Like all of us, he is dying. Like most of us, he doesn't know it. His chin on my leg, he trusts me with the weight of his head. So if I wish you mazel tov, know what I mean is, May you find a reason to open your door to the dark. I'll mean, may you live beneath good stars and take the time to notice. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, may you live beneath good stars and take the time to notice. Um, it is uh, John's turn now. Okay, thank you. Thank you to, uh, to Ron and Heather for inviting me to read these two wonderful poets tonight. Uh, I'm just gonna get right to the poems. Uh, the first poem is called Tree Stand. What's he thinking about alone up there after climbing the rickety ladder from the woodlot's leaf littered floor to his father's stand? strapped in the bench seat with his back pressed against oak trunk, dressed head to toe in camo, crossbow in his lap, buck knife strung from his belt, wearing oversized boots 
and stripes of lamp black smudged under his clear blue eyes as when he played center for the town team. Every inning, hustling back out to the bare spot he'd kicked free of turf, pounding his glove after making the catch. That easy loping run the girls in the stands came to watch, but never sure on the drive home if he really liked the game. Now his first teenage winter, stuck in his seat for hours with all that emptiness around him, where most days he'll tell you nothing happens. Always the cold wait for sunset, that sharp whistle, then the steady amber beam, his father's light coming at him from deep among the trees. The next poem is Pasture Ponds. The only thing you need to know here is uh, Massey Ferg is just an abbreviation for a Massey Ferguson tractor and Hyla Crucifer, the frog that I mentioned at the end is the, is the uh, is the spring peeper. The pasture ponds. You know the spot, that sharp left off the county road to Hope that passes the roadside shrine her classmates built to our youngest. The blank stones that mark the old Presbyterian graveyard. Then on past the last rusted knob of safety rail where a graveled lane cuts through swampy woods. The pair of Drake Mallard decoys, Hubert anchored to the bottom, riding out every weather on the big pond. The splotch of white on their sides that catches in our high beams as we round the curve. The twiggy rack of alder and sumac clipping the side views as we pass through streaks of moonlight, burnishing the shields on the skeleton runes of our friend's red massy fur. A place we've gone to many times, trying to nudge the season ahead. We crack open the side windows, crank the heater up a couple notches, sit with the lights clicked shut side by side in the front seat, wait for the first callers crawled free from March mud, the Hyla Crucifer, no bigger than a fingertip, noted in our dog-eared Petersons for shrill voices that rise, then fall, and those dark little crosses they carry on their backs. Next poem is Scrapple. Uh, I, I don't know if everyone else is familiar with it. It's, it's I best, the best description of it's a, it's a very popular uh, Pennsylvania Dutch breakfast food in, in, the, in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, New York, maybe this area, local area. Uh, this, is, this is kind of a, a recipe of how to make it. <laughs> Scrapple. I loved riding to the barn, standing on the tongue of the ball hitch on Newbridge tractor, watching bloody clods of mud spit off the treads of the red massy ferg into the dark as we drove all the leftover parts of the spring gilts he'd butchered over to the spigot to hose off before pouring them into the stainless vat set to a boil on an iron grate over the wood-fired stone pit spelling one another when our arms wearied of pushing the wooden paddle through the simmering offal of a hog, stoking the blaze with seasoned splits of ash and swamp maple, sleep pellets rattling hard against the metal roof while the blood leached hearts and livers floated past again and again, bubbling up to the surface with the severed heads, then sinking back down under the paddle's blade as we stirred and stirred and stirred past the hour the Guernseys knelt their great brown bodies down into heaps of straw and the barn cats disappeared behind shadows, fat rich licks of steam rising past our sweating faces, following the pitch of the rafters into a cloud that rolled along the breath of the wind bracing and dissipated into the dripping ridge line, while the tender strips of flesh soon to be strained, minced in the grinder and poured back into the spiced boil, slowly peeled away from hock and snout and bone. Gethsemane. When the disciple who loved him most unsheathed his sword and sliced off the centurion's ear, 
We all cheered and stomped the parquet floor in that February classroom where the steam pipes pounded hard to fight the below zero air seeping past the wall of cracked windows. And the purple crosses we'd drawn, cut and pasted that Lenten morning through shadows over our desk as sister shushed us with a wave of her pointer and pushed ahead to Jesus, spending the last coin from his tatted purse of miracles then ordered our shameful heads down on our desk after we hissed the return of the sword to the scabbard. All that surrender grinding again at my gut years later while I'm mudding in cabbages in my garden, maddened by a week of rain and the news out of Kabul, the stench of decay from another long winter. It's easy to see that bloody deer on the ground, the pale lobe mushrooming, through the twigs and bits of leaves, a fly stuck fast to the black clot, struggling before he breathed on it, passed his hand over the soldier's wound and gave himself up. This is one from, uh, from uh, Alaska Quarterly Review that was published a few years ago. Uh, the only thing you need to know here is uh, I re refer to the DNJ bar. That was our family bar in Jersey City. Counting the drawer at the DNJ bar. My guess is he didn't want me to see it. That if my old man knew I'd finished stacking last night's empties, he would have kept it stashed beneath the fat wad of 20s near the back of the cash drawer. Never mind that it had no cylinder, no magazine one chamber for one round. It was small enough to fit in the palm of his hand. And what my 12 year old brain loved most was how the snubbed barrel gleamed from the red glow of his Chesterfield. And the pearled handle drew in the color from every neon sign over the bar back. Rango red, Paps blue, Ballantine green. Even my old man's gold front tooth sharing some of its luster when he cocked his head to the side slowly locked his fingers around the grip and worked the action. My four-year-old refuses to enter the shark tunnel at Adventure Aquarium Camden. The crowd streams around us as we stand rock still in the entranceway, seawater fanned by hidden blowers shimmering in wavelets over the thick glass tube. Clapping her ears shut, she tells me the tunnel music sounds like when bad stuff happens in the movies. Sharks, black-tipped, sand tigers, hammerhead, cruise out from the shadows of the foul reef, nosing the glass walls, swim overhead from tank to tank, then disappear. Tonight, she whispers in my ear, they'll lead us in their dreams. Two more, the fox skull. My middle girl found it long after the crows had pecked the eyes, the gums, the supple stretch of tongue, after the palate and the fused cranial plates were licked clean by ants and left half hidden under the leaf fall our spaniel was snuffling through in a thicket near the high tension lines. My girl ran it home before her big brother and his friends could twist it away, shut herself in her room where she posed it on a silvery tray before the oval mirror of her white plastic vanity next to her dried tubes of playhouse makeup and last birthday crown. Button eye bears and limp legged cats staring from her pillows as the spaniel quivered, his soft wet black muzzle sniffing the air and yipping a shrill little want song to the girl while the locked out boys bounced their crazy dance outside her window, laughing wildly, screaming for what they wanted, chanting her name. And the last one will be Sing along. This is uh, the setting of this is all you need to know. It's in a you know a rehab nursing home that my mom was in in her last days. Sing along. Just a few days before her last trip to the ER, after she'd given up bingo and picking up her phone, and refused to get out of bed or leave her room, living on a few spoons of broth and packaged crackers she'd crushed with the side of her curled fist while they were still in their wrapper. I signed in at the desk and caught a flutter from the corner of the activities room where a jazz trio was swinging through some 40s hits. 
my mother's hand in the air and waving me next to her as she sang along with the band. The choir voice she'd screamed away 30 years ago at my father's funeral back again, strong enough that I could hear her over the thump of the stand-up bass, her fingers tapping the handrails of a wheelchair in rhythm with the drummer's brushing. Me, the silent one now, as she sang the words to song after song, stamping my foot and clapping along with the resonance when the band started to wrap it up, all of us begging for a little encore at the end of the set. Thank you. Oh, thank you, John and Francine and Jessica. We have a few more minutes um, before the end. And um, it's nice during this, when, when we have people like, like you here to maybe uh, hear, hear you talk a little about what you do and, and why you do it. And, and maybe even, you know, fairly informally and, uh, you know, just listening and, and watching you and then thinking about even the times we're in. Um, I, I keep thinking about that, that line from Joy Harjo, it's impossible to talk about this tragedy, she says in a poem, uh, you know, without poetry. And, and, you know, Francine's work, that's what you say where it came from, that the poems came out of trying to speak the unspeakable really. Um, and, and um, but then even to advance that, it seems like all of you found solace in the natural world or in animals or people or family. And so, I, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm not making the connections because I'm not a poet, um, but maybe, <laughs> maybe you all can um, talk a little bit about that. Cause it's these, um, I think right now we're, we're all looking for some way to make, make uh, for some solace, I suppose, of where we are now and, and poetry, um, you know, is it, it, both revelatory and, and, and true, but also there's some kind of joy in just talking about it and, and the way um, you see the world that is a benefit to those of us that hear you or read your poems. So I don't know, may, may, you can talk about anything you want, but that, those were just sort of things I was thinking of while you were, you were each talking this connection to tra tragic events at the outdoors and poetry. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Or is that too big? <laughs> you can really talk about anything you want if that's like, uh. um, I, I can, <laughs> I can, I can Thanks, lead Jessica. off. Um, okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, I mean, I think for me, um, what really kept me writing during the pandemic was having um, in external source in terms of the Torah and all the scholarship around it, but it was also going out into the woods, which was one of the few places that felt safe. Um, and I think in both of those, it just became really clear that we do not exist in isolation, that we are constantly acted upon by the world and acting upon the world, and that everything is happening in a cycle, um, which can be frustrating and upsetting, but I think is also a source of great wisdom um, to, to delve into. Um, so I think that, that that felt worth exploring um, deeply. And then I think when I'm writing, it's a, a, an effort to sit with those questions and then hopefully to share some of what I find um, with both myself and with other people. Either of you guys are welcome to jump in. Well, um, <clears throat> I found it kind of um, strange, maybe, or coincidental that uh, the poems that um, um, the others read were um, some of them <laughs> contained, you know, bi biblical language. And um, I just wanted to say, too, like, even in my poetry, there's, you know, there's... Um, Christian themes in there. And uh, I just found that kind of um, um, coincidental, I guess. But really, there's really no coincidences <laughs> either. That's what I believe. Anyways, um, with trauma, yes, I, I do believe that for me, you know, when when I was, when I was, um, um, 
working in that in the place where there is a lot of trauma you know and when I look back on my poetry it's like going back to places of safety for me you know when I when I it wasn't really a conscious decision when I started writing poetry it was only when I look back I found that a lot of my themes were um, about safety about um, people that maybe feel safe or 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 places you know um, where I was growing up so um, there's connections there definitely between the trauma and um, places of safety and where you feel that where you feel um, safe I don't know if that if that makes sense but um, and I and I really like the like you said, there is a lot of um, uh, the land, you know, about uh, we, we talk about the land. And, you know, for me, growing up on in Pelican Narrows, like we're really connected to the land. And um, that's where I feel um, really safe, you know, and, and I kind of take it for granted, too, because um, it's only like, I don't know if I'm just rambling here, <laughs> but um, it is really, you know, I, I really liked um, um, the poem uh, when um, she was writing about, about feeling safe in the land. And I could really relate to that. And um, and this time, yeah, there is a lot going on in the world, you know, with the wars and and famine and and uh, the the pandemic, you know, there is there is a lot going on, and and it is true. Like we are really connected. We're not we're not uh, we're we're not isolated. Like something that began somewhere on the other side of the world is, you know, it's uh, affecting us today and. Even with the gas prices going up, you know, that was almost immediate. So we're very much connected in this world. And I think a lot of the um, poetry that we write, like people can connect to it. And I think that's the beauty of poetry is that we, um, we can share uh, what we think, but it's not really just what we think. A lot of people think similarly you know, we speak for people. It's it's almost like um, my sister w w was telling me. You know, um, you put into words what I feel, and and it's almost kind of therapeutic when I read your work. So that's all I have to say. John, you're going to get the last word here. I think you need to, I can't hear you. So make sure your mic is on. Okay. Thank you. Well, everyone's talking about connections to the land. And, you know, I just you spoke about in my bio, uh, I grew up in Jersey City. I spent my formative years there, but uh, you would wonder, you know, where do some of these poems come from? Obviously, I, I moved out here at a, at a fairly young age with my family when they were very young also. And, uh, my connection to the land grew from my father, who was a Midwestern farm boy who just happened to be stationed in Jersey City for uh, for a year or so before he was shipped overseas to the war in Europe and uh, met my mom and and decided to stay in Jersey City. And we would visit the farm and I'd visit my grandparents. And I loved I loved the land. I always loved the land. Uh, and. I love the land out here. It gives me uh, it gives me inspiration every day to just you know walk to the window and look out, uh, and it really sustained me, my wife, and my family during the pan the, uh, the pandemic and and other times of stress. Just being able to go out to the woods or to walk the fields, or just to, to sit out on the on the, the front porch and just watch watch the birds or the animals. Uh, just kind of like watch life passing by. Do you think that in your Thank in your in your poems, there's a um, you know a, a a a spiritual quality to it that comes through in that? Um, you know, you you did the poem about <laughs> being in school with the little purple crosses that then oh, yeah. a little 
the little frogs with the crosses. I don't know. I was just thinking about that. Yeah, well, there's nature. There's nature. The little frogs with the little little crosses on the backs, uh, you know, gives us that that beautiful image. But uh, yeah, having spent many years in Catholic schools, it would, uh, I don't think I'd write um, <clears throat> many of my poems have, uh, you know, Christian Catholic imagery in them. So they kind of inform a lot of my poetry. No getting away from it. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks all, all three of you very much. I, I, um, I know speaking on behalf of the Center for Narrative and Lyric Arts, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to, to read for Alaska Quarterly Review and, and this series. And those of you um, that, are, that are watching, if you uh, wanna support writers like this, uh, probably the best way is to, to buy their books, <laughs> as Francine noted, and, and it's easy. Uh, you don't necessarily have to even go to the big A, you can go to your local bookstore and order one. Um, and of course, uh, John's is right brand new, uh, American Chestnut coming out just this week. Um, and uh, there's one forthcoming from, from uh, Jessica. And then we also have uh, your, your book in Cree, which um, uh, congratulations on that um, as well, Francine. So that's um, the best way to support these writers and also to think about um, giving a donation to Alaska Quarterly Review or just subscribing to this uh, literary magazine or, or any at this point. Um, that's what we can do to support um, uh, writers and poets and all of us to be able to, to hear it. I also want to thank again, um, Cody Carver at the Anchorage Museum at Rasmussen Center and uh, for making this possible. And as always, um, the last word is yours, Ron. Yeah, thank you, Heather. I want to thank uh, Francine, Jessica, and John for taking the time and supporting um, not only Alaska Quarterly, but sharing your voices. I think uh, what your sister told you, Francine, is true. Uh, and I think what we do is we give voice. We give voice to things that are important. Sometimes they're new. Sometimes they haven't been heard and sometimes they echo or shine a light on something that needs to be seen that everybody knows about and is not talking about. But nonetheless, uh, they make a difference. Um, whether they're in a past and memoir kind of re reflection or whether it's just something that is happening right now. In any event, giving voice to the world and life is what uh, writers do, not just the poets. Uh, everybody who is involved in the literary arts. It's an, it's, it, without it, we don't have the identity. We don't know who we are. Um, it's absolutely essential. And like everything else, it's being squeezed as well. Uh, so um, the one thing I, I also wanted to say, just a tiny little thing. I just love the idea of um, what, what you'd said, Francine, about the voices too, because Canada had uh, a, uh, Canada is a little bit more supportive of the arts, but um, on the other hand, indigenous voices were not um, <laughs> not showing up there until there were really strong efforts made. I mean, intentional efforts by like Dina Reeder and Sophie McCall and Simon Fraser and across Canada to say, hey, you know what? What's going on here? <laughs> What's going on with the canon? Uh, and so, um, so even in a place where things are much better and <laughs> stuff is respected, it takes a lot of work to get the voices out and get those stories told. Uh, and it takes a lot of courage. Um, and since I've published all three of your <laughs> works, I know that each one of you writes with courage and integrity. So I'm very grateful to you. Um, I wanna thank Heather, who is our, uh, our MC extraordinaire. Uh, and um, I want to say that next, uh, our next event is March 25. So that's two weeks from today. It's a combination nonfiction and poetry event. The poet is Bruce Bond. Uh, the nonfiction writers are Ann Kyer and Mary Kudnoff. And all of April, we have two events totally devoted to Poetry Month. So all of those two events will be totally um, 
focused on poetry. So with that, I hope to see people back um, in two weeks. And again, um, I want to thank um, our poets for their uh, support and their